welcome to Forbidden Planet TV uh, and we are joined today by the wonderful Frances Hardy to talk about uh, Unraveler, the, her newest book. So hi, welcome to Forbidden Planet TV. Thank you very much for having me. Not a problem at all. So um, what, without too many spoilers, <laughs> can you tell us about your latest book? Well, it's, it's a YA fantasy. It's quite dark and it's very weird. But that's actually a fairly good description of most of my books. Uh, this one is set in an alternative world, a country called Radith. And Radith has a couple of little quirks. And one of these quirks is that this otherwise fairly sensible, matter of fact looking country has a strip of misty marsh woods running along its coast. And these are called the wilds. And they're considerably larger and stranger than they look from the outside. It's, it's a realm of uh, strange creatures and dark dreams. It's, it's basically fairy realm. And the other little quirk is that anybody in Radith who is overwhelmed by rage or hatred or, or pain can develop the ability to curse their enemy. And a curse can turn someone to stone or transform them into some creature, set them on fire, steal their shadow. And in most cases, there's no cure. There is only one person who can unravel curses. Ah, and that brings us on wonderfully to the, the two main characters. Um, so we have Kellen and Nettle. So um, which character kind of came first or did they kind of come fully formed or was the world kind of built around them almost? Kind of where did you start? Uh, the first out of the two uh, to, to come to mind was Kellen. Mm -hmm. uh, Kellen is the unraveler of the title. He is the one person who can unravel curses and it's sort of a gift but it's certainly not one he asked for and it has some side effects. Uh, as well as being able to unravel curses, he also has a bit of an area effect. He tends to unconsciously and non-voluntarily and slowly unravel fabric and things like that around him. Um, he's also a bit of a firecracker. Basically, he's got a very big mouth and a very short fuse and tends to react badly to abusive power or people that he thinks are acting in bad faith or stupid. Um, so yes, he tends to annoy powerful people quite a lot. <laughs> um, the other protagonist, Nettle, sort of snuck into my head while I was thinking through what the, the story would be about, what, what Kellen's story would be about, and then took up considerably more space in it than I was expecting. Nettle was cursed. She and her three siblings were all cursed by their stepmother and she spent three years as a heron. And, and then she had her curse lifted by, by Kellen. The thing is, spending three years as a bird is not something you can just shrug off. And she actually feels that Kellen has a bit of a responsibility to her. Y you can't just pull someone out of the sky and they say, there you go, fixed, bye. <laughs> and Kellen has a slight tendency to do things like that. Mm -hmm. So she has become his companion and they're, they're, they're quite different in, in, in personality, in the way they approach the world, but also in the way that they handle anger. Both of them have quite a lot of anger, but Nettle's much more measured and thoughtful and controlled, whereas Kellen will basically go off like a rocket in any direction. <laughs> no, absolutely fair. And I think there's there's a huge amount of growth for Kellen in, in particular, because um, when the book starts, like you said, he's, he's almost quite idealistic about wrong, right, black and white kind of thing. And then obviously there's huge amounts of grey. So, um, but yeah, absolutely. Oh, just such a, such a wonderful, wonderful character. Um, and also, I suppose the the third kind of character would be the setting itself, because it almost it almost the wilds do feel like a character. So was that kind of 
based on uh, anywhere in particular or anywhere kind of um just think you went to university in oxford yes um so whether kind of any any of those kind of play a part in your uh, world building uh, there is a place that did help to inspire the wilds in particular but it's not in oxford yeah. um the, the last holiday i had just before the pandemic was to lagomera in the canary islands oh, okay. and there's uh, an amazing cloud forest called uh, well the garahone park and there you do have mist creeping sinuously through these woods that are absolutely dripping with moss it's so thick that sometimes it's almost hanging off the trees in sort of greenish swathes and beards and it, it does seem deeply otherworldly uh, of course this this is a cloud forest on on high ground not marsh woods uh, so I, I I did I took that and then made it a lot wetter <laughs> but I I also combined this this real place with old ideas of the folkloric forest mm -hmm. where you can meet anything or anyone where you have these dangerous and loaded encounters with unadulterated strangeness um, but also the fact that it's marshland as well means that i can draw in a lot of marshland folklore you know the the strange lights that lure you to, to your doom the creatures that may be lurking just below the surface and water-bound supernatural entities uh, there, there's there are some creatures called marsh horses which owe quite a lot to kelpies Okay, okay. And do you I, do you play D and D? Uh, I I am an addicted role player. <laughs> right. Um, okay. Not 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 so much A D and D um, and D and D so much yeah. these days because there are so many, many other games you can oh play. <laughs> but yes, uh, I play a lot of tabletop. Mm -hmm. uh, I also LARP um, and play free forms and man man ma managed to maintain my um, role playing habit even during the pandemic. Through the digital media <laughs> it was we would obviously talk about the pandemic before and there were certain things that definitely gaming and uh you know um making kind of online groups and D, &D you know it managed to survive so <laughs> I, I managed to attend a role-playing convention virtually wow. I mean, it was entirely virtual and so the, the games all took place over zoom or discord mm. things like that and because two one-off games I was going to be in involved being in a spaceship in some in some sense it made perfect sense in my head to get a bit handicrafts and make myself a yes. spaceship interior background <laughs> complete with LEDs that I could attach to my bookcase that's dedication uh, <laughs> I later made a steampunk submarine which I still have attached to my bookcase with zoom calls wow okay okay no, we, we need to get some photos of <laughs> Um, so just touching on um, the kind of two main characters again, so did any of the kind of the ideas from the book and from their relationship come from your childhood? I think I remember reading once that you briefly had a detective agency with your sister. <laughs> yes, this is true. I mean, we were about nine or ten and we didn't actually solve anything. But we were very enthusiastic for a bit and we collected newspaper clippings and spent some time following a man from our village because we thought he was a thief or very suspicious and we even tried to take his fingerprints off his lawnmower using sellotape and talcum powder. This did not work at all. <laughs> uh, the poor man probably still doesn't know why his lawnmower ended up covered in talcum powder. <laughs> but it was very fun. Did, some, did, did you guys have a name for your agency? I think it was the Harding Detective Agency. Oh, okay. Yes. Yes. I mean, that sounds pretty legit. So. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, we had business cards for each one of them felt it. Oh, wow. Oh, my God. I, I, I don't think I did anything quite as, quite as fun, but I remember going through a brief phase of being obsessed with Mario and the idea of being like a female plumber. But that's a very different, that's a very different dream. Um, so, with the um, kind of dual POVs, um, how did you kind of tackle writing the the two different characters? Did you kind of almost have to write each chapter and kind of come backwards and forwards, or was it kind of more one character and then and then the other? 
Uh, I, I was very much alternating, mm -hmm. but I was having to plan ahead a bit because there were certain things that I wanted to be viewed from certain points of view. Um, I'm going to be a little wary here about giving away too much, but <laughs> one of the challenges of writing this dual narrative is that there were certain things that I did not want to come out, and which might do, given that there is a secret held by one of those two protagonists. You probably know exactly <laughs> what I mean, but I'm not going to say any more than that. No, ab absolutely fine. Did, and did you find... Um, so are you kind of a, a planner when you write? Is there kind of notebooks and notebooks full of um, all these kind of, you know, various uh, plot points mm -hmm. and, and stuff? Um, yes, I'm very definitely a planner. Uh, it doesn't tend to be notebooks so much as um, word brainstorming documents and sometimes spreadsheets right. with timelines and things like that. Uh, but I do occasionally get lots of post-it notes and completely cover the table with sort of, you know, it's a kind of general sort of montage of crazy as I try to work out what goes where and certainly working out how to um, how to alternate the perspectives did definitely take a lot of work um, there are several reasons why I really like planning um, one is that I mean most of my books amongst other things are mysteries so I have to sort of know where they're going I need to know what the answers are. I need to pace my revelations and my red herrings and my clues. So the detective agency came in handy then? Yes, so. oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Um, and, and, well, the other reason I, I tend to plan is because I tend to fall massively out of love with my books about two thirds of the way through. And at that point, if I at least know where I'm going, then it's it's a bit easier to carry on at the point where it becomes crawling up, uh, like crawling over broken glass. But you do fall back in love with your books though, right? Eventually. Eventually. Yes. <laughs> um, after they've been published, okay. if people who owe me nothing show some signs of not hating me, then I gradually forgive them for existing. Okay. <laughs> so, um, kind of touching that on that idea, um, who do you feel you, you write your books for? Because it's quite interesting, quite often obviously they are younger characters, um, but there is something about the complexity and the atmosphere and stuff that obviously suits the, the adult reader as well. So um, are they kind of aimed at everyone? Um, well, my imagined reader is me, younger me. Yeah. Uh, some of my books are aimed at 12 year old me. Mm -hmm. Some of my books are aimed at 14 year old me. So. My, well, my younger self liked fantasy, liked creepy stuff, liked adventure, liked mystery, liked thrillers, um, and liked to be surprised. Mm -hmm. She liked encountering stories that she hadn't encountered before. And she could spot when she was being patronised a mile off, and she didn't like that. So I guess I'm bearing all these things in mind when I'm writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, I think that definitely comes across, but in a fantastic way, because you read it and, like I said, at any age, I feel very much that these books were missing from my kind of childhood as well, so I'm oh, thank you. a huge, huge fan. Um, so, how, would you ever consider revisiting any of your kind of previous books and previous worlds, either for a short story or kind of a comic adaptation? Uh, the short answer is I don't know. Uh, in the case of most of them, probably not. In the case of, well, I have two books that are actually in a series, Fly By Night and Twilight Robbery. I have always vaguely intended to go back to, to that series at some point. Uh, so I thought, you know, I'd quite like to write another Mosca book. The others, it's conceivable if I thought of a story I wanted to write mm -hmm. in those worlds, but at the moment, I tend to think of each of those arcs as having gone as far as I want to take them. Uh, I, I tend to write books with endings that aren't too neat. Mm -hmm. I, I like to leave a feeling that the characters and the worlds 
will go on to face new adventures and new challenges because that is how life works and I can't think of anything more depressing than leaving a 12 or 14 or 15 year old protagonist with an ending that sort of says and then everything was solved and nothing interesting ever <laughs> happened to them again. I mean that that would be the bleakest thing ever but I don't necessarily need to write mm. those stories. Um, also world building is one of the fun bits. Yes. And you see if I don't go back to those ones I get to make new worlds and use them for a story and then fling them aside. <laughs> no fair point and I think as well the best characters from whatever age you you read whatever book they just stick with you for life so yeah that they're still out there doing doing things getting up to mischief so um so can we ask what what you're working on now ah now i'm, <laughs> I'm not sure how much i'm allowed to say oh, okay. <laughs> but I should, I should be slightly cryptic okay okay so the uh there are a couple of works that I'm working on at the moment that are much shorter than this. I mean, I'm, granted, I'm that not saying much, um, but you know, considerably shorter. And I probably shouldn't say that too much about that. Uh, I'm also uh, starting work on another full-length novel, mm -hmm. which is going to be dark YA fantasy again. And I'm going to be cryptic about that as well. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> So you have quite a fun kind of quirky writing style. Um, what would you say if you could recommend kind of a book that you read in childhood that was suitably quirky and wonderful? Uh, what would you recommend? Uh, well, there is one book that was read to me by by my father, uh, and I think almost certainly had some effect on oh, my love of words, my, my sense that words are something that you could be quite playful with, and that's the Thirteen Clocks by James Thurber, which it's kind of a macabre, very tongue-in-cheek fairy tale, but it's very surreal and it does play around a lot with language and invented words. So there's, at one point, there's a terrible threat that somebody is going to be slit from their guggle to their zatch. Uh, and there is a dread monster uh, stealing, so it's, uh, stalking the, uh, the villain that is called the Total. And it, it gleeps and we, we never see it properly but we know that it's made of lip and that it moves like, sh like, like shadows and like monkeys and that it smells of unopened wounds and makes a noise like rabbits screaming. Thank you so much for, for joining us today and talking about uh, Unraveler, they're um, obviously a fantastic, fantastic book so thank you so much. Um, and yes, we will soon have signed copies available in all of our stores and on uh, ForbiddenPlanet.com. So watch this space and I'll talk to you soon. Bye. If you're enjoying watching Forbidden Planet TV and you're enjoying watching us talk to the world's most interesting and accomplished filmmakers, authors, artists, musicians, creators, subscribe right here. See you soon.